type of opportunities that the career development office is organizing for you guys are really incredible. These are things that I never had and would have saved me a lot of time and frustration and aggravation. And uh, these are real, really wonderful opportunities that you should take full advantage of. So today we're going to talk about the art of scientific publishing. Just so I have an idea of the audience, how many postdocs do we have? Uh, and how many students? Okay, uh, who has written a paper and published a paper in the scientific literature? Okay, fine. So today we want to talk about the art of scientific publishing, aka what does um, uh, your PI do a lot of uh, his or her time behind closed doors, but we don't want it to be a PI. You should be the person writing the work, doing the work, and reporting it as well. Um, and my last question, and then we'll stop. Does anybody know who this is? Nobody. So she you guys should know. Nobel Prize. I'm sorry? She received a Nobel Prize. Correct. Yeah. She received a Nobel Prize. What other wonderful thing can you say about her? She was a researcher in, in, the, yeah. in the fine borough of Bronx, New York. This is Rosalind Yalo, who got the 1977 Nobel Prize. And our story of uh, scientific publishing will also be related and um, uh, very connected to a story, a personal story of Dr. Yalo. But we'll get back to her later. So why should you publish? Why did you come to listen to the talk today? So why should you publish your data? Uh, there are many answers. One such answer is suggested in this slide. It's publish or perish, and he hasn't published. So the fact that you guys are here would seem to suggest that you don't want to perish, and therefore you want to learn how to publish. Um, but that's not the real reason, and of course there are multiple really great reasons uh, to publish. Uh, most of us went into science because we want to advance knowledge, and the only way that you advance knowledge is through research. And that research gets published and gets disseminated and gets shared through publications. And these publications are through scientific journals. We want to advance the field. We don't want somebody um, in a different country, a different state, a different lab uh, to do the same thing again. If we have a uh, important finding, we want to tell people about it. We want them to now understand what they've been doing wrong or perhaps advance their own science based upon your own observation. Um, so these are sort of uh, really important uh, and probably the main reason to publish, but they're also very practical reasons to, um, to publish. And that is, so there's publish or perish, and that is really not the main coin of the realm for academic advancement. And really, to get your academic job, you need grants. And the only way to get grants is to show that you can do the work <coughs> and that you can convince other people of the validity and truth of that work. And the way to do that is by publishing uh, in the journals. That is one. Two, um, grants are usually, hopefully, a multi-year um, uh, process, and you get your grant, and after one year you're supposed to show pro progress, that you accomplish at least some of the gain of the aims that you set out to accomplish when you propose your grant. How do you demonstrate that progress? How do you show that you generate preliminary results? You publish. Um, there's no other way to establish a reputation. That's good, that's bad, I'm a great scientist, my mice love me, Nobody cares about that. The only way that you will get a reputation is through what you publish and what people think about what you publish. Um, for this audience, it's very relevant that soon, either for the, your postdoc or for the postdoc for the post postdoc position, you will need to have publications. There is no other way. Anybody who tells you differently is not exactly living in a realistic world. You need publications. That is the currency with which you move from stage to stage in your academic life. 
And even in your non-academic life, even if you're not going to be a PI, even if you want to advance in other ways in science, that is a very important measure of your productivity. And finally, all of us have mothers, uh, and those mothers want something to show for all of the uh, aggravation that we've caused them over the years, all of the loans that they took out in your names or you took out, out for yourself. And here, at least, um, while everybody else is a high-paid lawyer on, on Wall Street, at least you have a first author paper in science and nature. What can you publish? What are the different types of publications? So when we talk about publications, really what's important for the scientific crowd, which is here, is research articles. Research articles are the primary publications that people look at um, and people count. So I also, um, over the years, have sat on promotion committees. People sit and count one by one, and they will tell you you had three publications as a first author, two as a second author, and one as a last author. And most of the decisions regarding promotion grants are based upon that metric, and it is mostly research articles. They don't necessarily have to be very long. So Natalie chose for me a very a classical article, uh, the Watson and Crick article. It's one page. That's it. There's no nothing else. It's one page. It's a research article. Um, there, you should know about, there's some variation that uh, articles in nature are called letters for some reason. Everybody knows that these are research articles. Review articles. Review articles can be either invited or submitted by yourself, meaning you, you are publishing on, on, uh, on yeast genetics and you're a known quantity in yeast genetics and the editor of the journal of yeast genetics wants a good review so they will contact you. So that's one way. Second way is that you have an interesting idea or there's been a lot of advances in the field. You think that your readership would enjoy a particular a synthesis of those ideas and you put together a review article. Sometimes it's a good idea of sending an editor the one-liner saying, I suggest a recent review, I, a new review about this. What do you think about it? Sometimes you just send it cold and hope that they will um, uh, accept it. Historical reviews are more for those uh, people who, who are interested in the history. These are always very interesting reading, uh, but they're not highly counted, unfortunately. Methodologies, if you are the world expert on Western blotting and you and every single person who does a Western blot quotes your protocol that you publish in a protocol or method sort of journal, that is good. That's a, a research article. Um, there are some articles that are, uh, that are research articles, but they're shorter. That's fine. Um, it doesn't have to be 17 pages. Again, go back to Watson and Crick. Uh, if there was one paper that revolutionized molecular biology in the world of science in the last 60 years, it was this paper, and again, it's one page, it doesn't have to be long. For the medical trainees uh, in the audience, if there are any, uh, there's always opportunity to publish case reports, very interesting, instructive cases, either as a single report or a case series. Um, this is good practice, it gets you started, it's not that difficult to come up, you don't have to come up with a novel idea, you have to come up with a novel patient, a novel connection, a novel observation. Um, accordingly, this is less well thought of. Somebody who just publishes case reports or case series is not going to be well thought of uh, when promotion time comes along <coughs> in, the scientific, um, in the scientific promotion track. Where should I publish my data? So if you have a choice, you would want everything of yours to go in science and nature. As you know, we'll talk about that later. The rejection rate is too high for them to accommodate that. And that's at least one of the reasons that there's such a proliferation of journals. There are thousands and thousands of journals, and hundreds of new journals come out every year. So how do you sort of make sense of where you're going to publish out of this tremendous uh, uh, mix, mixture of, of journals 
that really um, it's very hard to keep track of. So probably now getting back to getting to the art of publishing and what do you do and how do you do it, your first step is selecting your journal. Where do you want to publish? And that is a critical, really a critical uh, decision to make. Um, and it will save you a lot of grief on the way. So deciding where you want to publish is, there are a lot of factors that play into this, where you would love to publish and where you would actually think that it's reasonable to publish. You really have to choose one with the right focus and it depends on your paper. Clearly, a, if it's a medical case report, it's not going to be published in nature. And if you have a really unique uh, new method, spin on the method, you're not going to publish it in a medical journal, etc. So think of the type of paper that you publish. You have to have a, um, and one of the messages of today is one has to have a pretty decent grasp of the field. Each one has their own field of interest and has to know where are the method papers in molecular biology being published? Where are the scientific observations? Where are the highly thought of papers, where are they published? And who is the target audience? Is it a general scientific audience? Is it experts in the field? It's only people who do RNA, something that uh, of more broad appeal to cell biologists? Now the focus after you ask these questions of yourself. Um, have they ever heard about impact factors here? I think so, yeah. Impact factors. Impact factors is one, is exactly like the US News and World Report ranking of medical and graduate schools, where every single dean says it's the worst, how do they do it, and it's totally incorrect, and we don't believe in it. And guess what? Every single medical school is pays a lot of money to get the first glimpse at that ranking that is incorrect and improperly done, and that's how people decide on their decisions. That's how people decide on how to, where to pursue their career. Everybody looks at those rankings. Very, very similar impact factor. I don't want to discuss how it's calculated, but basically it's sort of a single number that decides on the relative importance of the journal to the field. How do we know that this is accurate? So you guys know graduate schools, right? So go to the listing of graduate schools. So go to the listing of hospitals. And what are the good hospitals in the country? Harvard and Hopkins and Mayo Clinic and Baylor and Sloan Kettering. Go to the hospital list and you'll see exactly. So they're the top five. So maybe one and three are switched, but they get it right. Impact factors get it right. What is the highest ranked journal? Guess. Nature is. What is the second? If nature is the first, what is the second? Science. Science. Who are the immunologists in the audience? Immunology, what are the best ranked journals in immunology? If you would have, where would you want to publish? Give me three. Nature, Nature immunology, immunity, one more. Journal of immunology. You missed, you got four out of five, journal experimental medicine. But we know what the best journals, and guess what? The impact factors are really very close. So you want to decide to publish in a high impact journal. This also uh, will define your, there's a very close correlation between your rejection rate and impact factor. The higher the uh, impact factor, the high, usually the higher the um, rejection rate. There is a new something to, to discuss, and that is open access versus traditional. Traditional is the using, usual way, open access have all sorts of variations. They have open review policies. They will publish anything as long as uh, they publish the comments together with it, or they will publish anything, but it's not a subscription base. The author has to pay about $2,000 per article, and then everybody could access it without any limitations. Um, usually, the open access are newer and have less of an impact factor than the traditional journal. Publishing costs. Um, you know, if they tell you, come up with $2,000 and we'll publish your article in Nature, probably that won't be a problem for most of us. So this is really not that such of a major hurdle. I told you about acceptance rates, impact factors, acceptance rates, um, reputation, and time all sort of uh, 
act together, right? If you have to get your paper out and you're applying for a job next year because your spouse has accepted a job in Minnesota and you have to move to Minnesota, so you'll send your paper perhaps to uh, a lesser journal that will get it published or accepted more quickly and, and, and publish it more quickly. From the other hand, you have a lot of time and you're beautiful, you have multiple observations and people, none of the people in competing fields have, have, uh, have, are describing the same thing, then you have time and why shouldn't you wait to publish in the best journal that you, you can. Read, read, read. You have to know the journals in your field so you know what goes what. And the postdocs in, in the audience, I'm sure, have sort of a taste already um, which papers are suitable for which journals. And the students should start to have that sort of um, gestalt. And probably your PI should be relatively um, uh, involved early in the decision. So when I was looking at this slide again today, I thought that choosing a journal, you should think about your college days, right? Everybody as a senior in high school had three choices. You had your REIT school, and then you had your SAFE school, and then you had the school that you were okay with in the middle. Remember that? So it's very similar with, with journals. You should have the one which, if everything breaks exactly right, you'll get published in, and then there's a journal that it's probably okay as it is, and then there's something which really um, um, you'd be fine with it. Better than you're safe, not exactly your reads. Look at the target journal. You chose your journal, look at it. Do they publish long or short? If you have something that you need 20 figures to say, you know, if they have a limit of six figures, they're not going to take your paper. It doesn't matter. If they limit you in words and you're a verbose person, do not send there. That's not the right journal for you. If it's uh, something that you think you could meet about, that's having a reasonable length is actually good for you because that sort of focuses people on uh, what they want to say. You need to focus and be concise. Don't, you know, it's not your thesis. Your thesis either wrote already or you don't need to write yet. It's a paper. Keep it a paper. Um, People are, that are reading it are usually just as smart as you are. If not smarter, they don't need all of the background. The appropriate person will probably read the paper, and if they are a reviewer, they know the background. You don't have to write all of it. It's a big challenge. What should you put in? What should you not put in? Um, think about that before you start to cut. Have your story ready in your mind before you start writing. Uh, just uh, stylistic issues. When you write, write active. Not the Western blot was run at, but rather we did X, and not the observation was, but rather we found that, we observed that. Um, it's very royal. We say we, even single author papers. It's a little bit funny sometimes, but that's, that's the convention. That's what we do. Um, <coughs> when you say we did something, then you say, we found that anti-DNA antibodies cause renal damage. When you say Dr. Y found, so that is in past tense. Getting started <coughs> is really the hardest part. There is, you know, think back again to your college essays. Putting the first sentence on paper, in my experience, is really the most, most difficult thing. So I will give you two suggestions. Do with you whatever, whichever one you want. I'll give you Natalie's suggestion, who published a few papers. And I'll give you my suggestion, and I published 150 papers. So you can do whatever you want. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but really, there's, there's no right answer. The point is do whatever, what, what is easiest for you. And I won't tell you who suggested what. So it's, it's not, it wasn't a knock on Natalie. God forbid. Um, so one way is just, what is a take-home message, all right? When you meet your friend in the, in the conference and you say, what have you been doing? We found that outbreak afterwards what comes should be relatively easy. Um, here's another suggestion, starting with the methods. That, I think, for people who 
haven't written a lot of papers might also be a good suggestion because basically you're copying from your lab notebook. Hopefully you have a organized lab notebook and you have a methods uh, folder and it's on your lab computer and all you have to do to describe your Eliza is go to your lab computer and take that out and put it. That's the methods and just write it not as bullet points but rather as a sequential sentences. So the methods to me is the easiest part to write. Write the methods. Okay, you wrote the methods. What do you do next? After the methods, you're writing your results. Why you write the results? Because now you're giving lab meeting. What do you do in lab meeting? You don't describe the results. You don't describe the methods. You just describe your results. So give your lab meeting. Describe the result. This is my first result, second result, third result, fourth result. So number two is the method, is the results. Number three is the discussion. You just, again, you're answering the questions that the people in lab meeting or in the conferences where you're presenting are asking you. And then when you have that together, you go back to the introduction, which sort of writes itself. We all have been there, right? You have everything ready, and then you start to fidget, and you look at Facebook, and you go back to msn.com, and all the heat Celtics playing tonight write that first sentence, force yourself to do that, and then it becomes much easier. Uh, scientific papers have this sort of generic, these are research papers, have a generic structure. Start with title, abstract and keywords, and then there's the IMRAD structure, introduction, uh, methods and materials, results, and discussion. There's literature cited or references, and then in parentheses, supplemental data, sometimes you edit, sometimes you don't, sometimes journal accepted, sometimes do not. But this is sort of the very, very generic uh, structure of all papers. The brief communications that we discussed, they will shorten the materials and methods, and sometimes they'll combine results and, dis and, and discussion. But basically, every single paper has this, and that probably is not going to change. Um, title. Title is important. It has to be catchy, has to be sexy, has to be attractive, has to be snappy, has to be something that will attract. Okay? This is the first impression a reader has of your manuscript. Sometimes it's the only impression a reader has of your manuscript because if they're not interested, they're not going to read further. Um, you want it to be informative and engaging and will entice the reader, hopefully, to pursue to the next step. Um, and you could be cute, uh, you could be um, you know, declarative, you could ask a question, whatever you want. Make it, and sometimes also the journal will tell you they want it, they don't want questions, they don't want uh, colons in the middle, they want it 40, 40 uh, 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 words long, they will tell you. Play around with it. It's easy to write a title, find something catchy, and determine which one works best for you. If you did your work correctly with the title, you write the abstract. Abstract, I tend to write at the end, because that's basically writing the whole paper in, in a microcosm, especially if there's a structured abstract. So structured abstract basically has introduction to introduction and background, methods, results, and conclusions. So it's very, very similar to, a, uh, to the structure of the whole paper. And then there's just most abstracts are in a narrative form where you just uh, um, write that at the end. That could be difficult. Uh, it gives the, the, the readers the message of your paper and hits on all the major uh, key points. Even those people that are aren't sure whether they really want to read the paper, most of them will read your abstract. So hook them with the abstract, maybe they'll go for the paper, or at least they'll remember the paper. Uh, so I started by reading all the papers. This is what I did. So I started by reading all the whole paper. And I said, why am I reading the materials and methods? So I, I dropped that out. And then I said, this is too long. And I focused on the results and discussion. And I moved to just reading the abstract, and now I just focus on the title. So a lot of people have a lot of things to do. Abstract is really a great place to, to get them interested in what you have to say. Introduction should be brief. Again, these are experts reviewing it. 
get to the meat of the matter. What is the problem? What is the gap in knowledge? What is the question that, what is your hypothesis that you generated based upon current data? And how in this study you will be addressing this gap in, um, in knowledge? What is currently known? Briefly, two or three sentences, a paragraph. In the introduction, you have to reference key papers. Why? One, chances are that the reviewer of your paper is going to be the author of one of these papers because they are an expert in the field. You do not want to piss off the reviewer in the first paragraph. That is not a way for your paper to be accepted. Number two, you want to show people that you know what the state of science is now and why do you need to write something new about it. Keep it short and to the point, a couple of paragraphs, a page long, page and a half long. Methods, you have to describe your techniques. Journals a little bit waffle on that. Some people want detailed, some are happy with you quoting previous times that you do it, but you definitely want to mention the important details, how long you incubated for, what the concentration was, what is the source of your antibody. Everybody knows how to do Western blot in your world. You don't, maybe you don't have to include that, but if you're using some fancy technique, Please describe it. Systematic, usually follow the way you actually did the experiments. Start with the mice, where did they come from, your basic uh, breeding, um, your, your major methods, and then your secondary methods afterwards. You do theoretically have to provide enough data for the studies to be replicated. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not correct, even though he gets it 99% uh, right. Um, PhD comics. No, no, if you make a paper too easy to read, everybody will know how you got the results. That's exactly what the methods are for. Theoretically, that is how we proceed in science, right? You have to be able to replicate the results. The results are the meat of the paper, and they really give the evidence. Um, and they interpret what you are showing. For example, uh, your hypothesis was that gene X is important in immunoregulation. To determine the role of gene X in immunoregulation, we looked at B cell autoreactivity in mice that were knocked out for this gene. That's the background. So you tell people where you are. Then you found, we found that, one, two, three, and four. Therefore, it would appear that X, Y, Z. That is like a good paragraph of the results. Reviewers cannot read your mind if you're making assumptions, justify them. Saying that, you know, if A equals B and B equals C, A equals C, but sort of take them through that, that line of thinking. All of your key results have to be there. Don't let the reviewer make that, or the reader, which is actually the more important, make that leap. Uh, if you have these long, complicated things that nobody reads, everybody falls asleep in lab meeting, probably they will fall asleep when they read that, put that in the supplemental data, and as I did initially, keep them, you know, let them understand your logic, why you're doing that. To exclude reason A for observation B, we therefore did that experiment. To confirm that experiment, we used another method to show the same thing, and this is what we found. What are you doing in your discussion? The last part of the paper, you summarize your results. You, you mention how you address the research question. Again, make it interesting. Now they're making their decision. Even if they're not so sure about your results, impress them with, why is it important? Why is it novel? Why is it significant? Why is it advancing the field? Why is this worth you know, um, hacking down a few more trees? put it in context. You're probably not the only one that's working in your corner of the universe. Put it in context. How does that fit with what other investigators in the field are doing? And be upfront, but maybe not, you know, don't spend 40 papers pointing out your own critiques. The reviewers will be happy to do that for you. But if they're major ones, saying we can only you know, look at 20 mice in each group because they bred very slowly, so point that out. Accept that as a knowledge. Accept that as a weakness. Accept it as a limitation. It has to be different than the introduction. 
Um, it's easy. So actually, the introduction I said comes first, but the discussion is easier to write, and then you go back to the introduction. There's a part of acknowledgement um, where you say we thank Dr. Y for giving me a good suggestion on the flow cytometry. These are for contributions that don't merit authorship. Uh, you don't usually say thank you to your kindergarten teacher. You need something more than that, some concrete contribution to uh, your actual observations. But this is something that doesn't uh, rise to meriting full authorship. You, if you gave it to your friend from a competing lab who read it, had some suggestions, that's a good place to put the contributions and where you put your funding source as well. So this is to remind me the slide and the acknowledgments is first of all to say thank you to Natalie who put this presentation together. It's her initiative, her idea, her everything. <laughs> oh, hi, Jackie. Is Jackie here? Right here. There you So Jackie and Natalie put the large majority of this together and it was definitely their initiative and they did a fabulous job. And Jörg, we already discussed, and thank you for supporting this, and this was excellent. So even that people do this at the end, but this is sort of example of what you do during acknowledgments. References, document previous research. Uh, be balanced. Don't only quote the papers that support your point of view. If there's something that is contradictory, acknowledge it and explain it. Uh, it also shows that you're smart and that you know the field. And especially if you contributed to that field, it shows that here, I did one, two, three, and four, and that's why five and six make sense. You know, if I would quote everything in every paper, the reference list would really be too long. You have to select the really most important papers. And another um, uh, good hint, sometimes rookies in the field don't, you know, it's very easy to quote a a review paper because then you could reference that paper 50 times and it says the 50 statements you're trying to. That is supposed to be bad form in a scientific paper. You have to quote, go back to the original article, read that original article, make sure it says what you report it to say. What's a good paper? It has solid data, it's well written, and it tells a story. It has a start, has a context, and has a finish to it. Um, it should have an interesting hypothesis. Uh, should be clear and flow and complete and clear. You really can't emphasize those, those things enough. Um, even though the reviewer probably will not go home and reproduce that particular experiment, theoretically, if they want to, they should be able to do it based upon your materials and materials. So who's on first? Who's, who's the author? So. This alone is, is like a whole couple of hours to discuss. Um, what the journals say, intellectual contribution. What does that mean? Is running uh, two ELISAs for your intellectual contribution? There's a lot of gray area there. And my suggestion is to drop that on your PI's lab. It's clear you're the first author, it's your work. Let the PI decide, tell the PI these are the people that contributed, and let the PI uh, argue with them who's on that author list. Uh, the relative ranking, who wrote the paper, who did the experiments, who contributed the mice, is very important. That's where politics come in. It gets very messy sometimes, and sometimes it's best, your position is clear, to sort of leave it to the, to the heavyweights. You, Traditionally, the first author actually did the work. The last author is the intellectual heavyweight, the PI, uh, in whose work the lab was done, even though it could have been your idea, of course, but you know, the, he, got, he or she got the grant, so he's last author. Co-authors are sort of in decreasing contribution, so the second is more important than the third, is more important than the fourth. And because people are sick and tired of arguing who's on first and who's on second, so this cartoon says, welcome to the co-author party, you're number 21. So again, Watson and Crick's paper, had it been published today, there would have been at least 40 authors. That's a little bit too much. There's author inflation. 
sort of make sure only the people that deserve to uh, should be on that paper. Tell the story, be clear, comprehensive, and concise. Um, review the relevant literature. It's OK to toot your own horn and emphasize what you contributed. Don't ignore submission guidelines. There's nothing that pisses off a reviewer more than the fact that you don't read what, how you're supposed to submit the paper, how many words it's supposed to be, if the methods come after the results or before. I won't even talk about plagiarism and fabrication. Um, journals don't like you to plagiarize yourself. Do not, do not <coughs> copy and paste uh, methods from journal to journal. Even if you wrote it, journals don't like that. And try, even though experts are reading it, there might be a general science reader, uh, and they often are in the readership, so try not to use too much jargon and abbreviations. Before you submit, listen to your friends, hear what they have to say, ask many people as you have patience for to read it and review it. Um, become familiar with the journal staff, we'll talk about that soon. And I said that, I'll say that again, read those instructions. There is nothing that upsets a reviewer more when you do not follow those instructions exactly. As for everything that has to do with the technicalities of writing that paper. How to submit, I remember when we used to go to the photocopy machine and photocopy four copies and put them in envelopes and it's not done that way. It's, it's virtually all electronic and each journal has its own website. Cover letter is very important. Um, you don't have to have a cover letter for many journals. I find that it's extraordinarily helpful. It's your first chance of grabbing the editor's eye in which you say, and closes the article, we wrote it, it's not being published anywhere else, and this is why I think it's important. This is really what the contribution of this paper is. And this is a type of reviewer that would best be suited to review it. So it's a novel finding. It's an exciting finding. It's the first time gene X was found with disease Y. And therefore, I think people that read Journal of Immunology would be very exciting in reading that. Um, this depends on the journal. This might, they will tell you either on the website or in the cover letter if you could suggest reviewers, and if they're reviewers that you would like to exclude for reasons of competition. So this is an overview of what actually happens once you electronically submit it. Gets to the journal, goes to an editor, through associate editors, and we'll talk about those people. Reviewers are assigned. They prepare recommendations. It gets back to the head honcho, and then there is a decision. So how does this actually work. That is the job of the editorial board by the editor or the co-editors who receive the papers and they play the major role in deciding their fate. The associate editors, even the, even the editor of nature is not an expert in all aspects of science. They have associate editors that are expert in particular areas and they decide if there's initial validity to that paper and which reviewers would be best suited to review that paper. And then the reviewers are actually the people that beside the associate editors are reading your work and either praising it or damning it as the case may be. So what the editor, all the submissions go to the editor. Um, in many journals, if they don't like the look or it's sloppy or they don't like the title or it's irrelevant, they will reject the paper outright or will select the appropriate editor that has the expertise to give a learned opinion on that uh, paper. The editor is all powerful, and he or she can overrule or accept any decisions or recommendations by the associate editor and reviewers. The associate editor is probably the first person who reads the individual paper in detail decides whether it's worth, worthwhile or not. Um, if your paper goes to review, you know you've passed an important hurdle. This hurdle is very, very high in papers with high uh, rejection rates. So about half of the papers are rejected outright, 
Another half were rejected by the reviewers. The associate editors consolidate the opinions of the reviewers. They will offer a recommendation. And sometimes, often, they will have to remind the review, you know, that there's this graduate student that's sitting there um, wanting to know whether they'll be graduating within the next decade. And please, you know, submit your, your recommendation as soon as possible. So how many scientists are there in the United States or in the world? Probably a couple of million. So of those, invariably, those that are selected to review your articles are your mortal enemy. Why? It's just a rule of science. You have to accept it. Those people that will review your article are always those that happen to be people that you're not talking to since second grade. Their job is to provide an expert judgment on the merits of the paper, report that. They don't send their comments to you. They send them to the associate editor, and they will recommend either to reject, with or without revisions, or publication. So again, this is how it goes. It writes to the manuscript. If the editor doesn't like the paper, doesn't like you, they sort of reject it right away. If they like it, goes to the associate editor, who gives it to the reviewers. Two to three, depending on the journal. What are the reviewers looking for? Is it an important biological question? Is the finding right? Is the methodology innovative? Does it advance understanding, or is it just sort of a me too paper? Um, you know, once they found that penicillin A helps pneumonia, it really doesn't help that penicillin B helps pneumonia. It's basically the same drug. Does the data make sense? It's eternally consistent. Um, is it solid, convincing? All the things that they ask in lab meeting, it's no different. Did they use controls? Did you repeat the experiment several times? Uh, is the data convincing? Could it be improved in any way? And basically, they will make the decision based upon the fact that the implications important. And is it convincing enough to publish in this journal? Um, it's a whole different story. We're running out of time. Um, and maybe that's something to discuss a different uh, um, opportunity. How to be an effective viewer. I will leave you with one. Last thing, if you're ever asked to review, just remember, love thy neighbor as you love thyself. Don't do unto others what you don't want done to you. The exact type of reviews that you want to get, fair, balanced, detailed, reasonable, uh, timely, you owe that to your fellow colleagues as well. What happens after review? It's accepted as is. That is very rare. Very, very rare and basically only happens in fairy tales or in the days of the giants. That means when your PI was your age, and that's what's going to happen when you tell your student, oh, in my day, you know, my papers got accepted. Most of the time, the decisions are in the middle um, where the paper needs to be revised. It could either be minor revisions, where usually it doesn't go back for re review or major revisions where often the paper needs to be re-reviewed, most often by the reviewers that uh, read it the first time. When you address your review, remember to respond point by point. Exactly, you know, reviewer A had comment one, two, three. You write your letter saying, okay, and address, and because of comment A, we went back and did that experiment another way. In response to comment B, there weren't enough mice, we uh, raised another cohort of mice and did the same experiment and got the same results. The more detailed your letter will be, the more reasonable it will be, uh, the more not argumentative but focused and appropriate, the better it is you have a chance of getting your major revision accepted. They will usually give you a deadline. Address it. Don't leave your paper. If you leave your paper for six to nine months, they will address it as a new uh, new as a new submission. And then there's what we all don't like, and even though I have a lot of accepted papers, unfortunately, I went through rejection a lot of times. And um, there are two ways once you have a paper rejected. You could say sending it to a different journal, or just saying that journal didn't want it, why should I listen to them? I'll send it to a new journal. Either way, our techniques uh, people use. 
a really tough world out there for the best journals. These are the percent of papers that are accepted in these journals. Nature, 92% of papers are rejected. And think of how many people don't even send to Nature in the first place. So this is self-selected. And most papers are, and then there are journals which have a slightly higher acceptance rate. Um, for some reason, I send a lot of my journal, my papers to the Journal of Universal Rejection, and uh, the paper is, is dealt with appropriately. So let's go back to Dr. Gallo as we're, we're um, wrapping things up, right? You spent your life, three years, two years of your life, working day and night and weekends, and you send your paper to a, let's say, good journal in the middle, let's say Journal of Immunology, and they reject it, right? So you tear your heart out, and you don't know how to do science, and let me find a different career, and let me go into medical school, and I'm out of here. So that is not an appropriate response. And why is that not an appropriate response? The reason is, is because reviewers, they're smart, they're committed, uh, but they're human beings, and they make mistakes. So let me take you to a letter that Rosalind Yala got from the Journal of Clinical Investigation, a very good journal, a good review, in which they informed her, I you, Dr. Burson, I regret that revision of your paper in title XYZ is not acceptable for publication. This is the paper that got her the Nobel Prize. The reviewers did not recognize the importance of the paper, and they just missed the boat. This same paper is what got her the Nobel Prize. Okay? Reviewers don't know it all. Things happen. Reviewers had a bad day. They also have you know, spouses and kids and friends that don't always uh, make their life easy. And they don't always get it right. So do not be discouraged. And if you don't, it doesn't work the first time, it'll work the second, and it work, will work the third. So let's just go to the summary. Choose your journal carefully. Um, choose do you want to stretch or do you want a safe outlet? Um, get familiar with the journal standards and requirements and think like a reviewer. Be critical of your own work. You can't do that. You've been doing this for too long, that same paper. Give it to somebody else, and they'll be very, very happy to critique your, your work for you. Get feedback from your peers. It should be clear and lucid and with good language and with appropriate ga grammar and without jargon and a pleasure to read. If you get a uh, you review without rejection, saying revise it. That's a great decision. Be very careful in how you address the comments. It's a good idea to accept and you know follow through on most of them. We submit. Never take it personally. I know that Dr. Yala didn't, or else she would have left science at the time. And you will get your papers published. And finally, the last two slides just to tell you that today's. Uh, presentation is co-sponsored by the Einstein Journal of Biology and Medicine, which is a peer-reviewed journal um, published here at Einstein. It's already from 1984, published two, two times a year. What's important for you to know is that they are now working on getting an impact factor. So first of all, it's widely read, and it's absolutely a great place for a young person to start. Natalie and Jackie did promise that they will be very, very open and helpful and not critical, and they will not trash your paper, not put it aside for six months before they give you an answer, and all the things that other journals do. And definitely, if you want a small review, something to get your hand on, definitely for a student, a young postdoc, it's absolutely appropriate to as a journal to start, and Natalie will be staying here afterwards if somebody has ideas or suggestions and wants to talk about that, that is absolutely uh, okay. So we started with Publish and Perish, um, but really I thought it was Publish or Paris, but it's not Publish or Paris, so now you know, and good luck. <laughs>